This week on the Back Table Podcast. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Kidney cancer is finally entering the era of really truly personalized medicine. I think with some of the diagnostic and therapeutic technologies that you've mentioned, you know, things like circulating tumor DNA, tumor profiling to understand, you know, which patients are at, at high degree probability of relapse, and if they do relapse, how to treat them. And I think we finally have the tools that may allow us to deliver therapies that are likely impact the biology that the patient possesses. And so this is, you know, again, a truly, truly an exciting era where we're now combining multiple specialist specialties. You know, we, we're utilizing predictors of response in the form of circulating tumor cells or circulating tumor DNA. We're finally entering the per personalized era in the management of kidney cancer. Welcome back to the Backtable Urology Podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. This is Aditya Bagrodia as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, Vitaly Margulis from the UT Southwestern Department of Urology. Thank you for joining us here today, Vitaly. Uh, how's the weekend going so far? Great, Aditya, and uh, great uh, to be here with you. All right, fantastic. So brief introduction, Vitaly is a professor at uh, UT Southwestern. He did his residency here, trained at MD Anderson for fellowship, and he's been back now and really a backbone of our, of our department. He's been a thought leader in management of localized and locally advanced uh, kidney cancer. So we're really excited to uh, hear your thoughts today, Vitaly. And um, with that, we'll just kick off. So I want to ask you, Vitaly, when you hear about locally advanced kidney cancer, what clinical states does that exactly mean for you? So these will be non-metastatic patients, first of all, and with some radiographically advanced features. So things like extension of the primary into perirenal tissues, extending um, or extension into um, things like perinephric fat, adrenal gland, extension into the venous system, as, as uh, you may know, uh, kidney cancer is unusual, it has propensity to invade uh, venous outflow structures such as renal vein, cava, and so on. Um, and those tumors really with regional nodal disease. So so um, those I would consider to be locally advanced. Okay. Okay, good. Just to make sure the audience is on the same page in terms of the clinical states that we're talking about. And, um, you know, 101, any particular aspects of the history and physical exam that become more relevant in these patients? Um, uh, certainly, I mean, I, I think in, in any case, it's probably prudent to do a, a good uh, uh, history and physical focused things to think about, uh, specifically pertaining to this situation are things that may have to do with, for example, signs or symptoms of venous obstruction, uh, because it may change how you how you ultimately manage the case, you know, things to look for, you know, uh, uh, again, pertaining to the signs of venous obstruction, you know, leg swelling, caput medusa, uh, any signs of hepatic congestion, hepatic insufficiency. Uh, when, when you start talking about locally advanced things, may be important to to probe around. Um, you know, any cognitive defects, any sort of anything that has to do with CNS. You know, and your, your usual things like um, obviously, um, you know, weight losses, appetite changes, things like that. Over that, that may have ensued over upcoming months. Okay. Okay. Uh, helpful. And what about staging? What are your preferred means of staging these patients? I mean, generally, I would say majority of the cases, uh, a, 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 uh, a quality cross-sectional imaging, whether it be C, you know, CT or an MRI, are generally sufficient. I think it's, it's important to know that once we start looking into um, or understanding that we're dealing with a uh, tumor that invades into the venous system, I think MRI is probably preferable, preferable, again, in terms of appropriate staging, but also to plan this, the subsequent surgical management. Okay. And um, for the chest, chest X-ray sufficient, chest CT preferred, any strong thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I, certainly again, you know, uh, kidney cancer is notorious for predilection for pulmonary metastasis. And I think if you're really interested in determining if the pulmonary metastases are present, uh, CT of the chest probably should be performed. Um, certainly, you know, in more advanced cases where there's extension above the diaphragm, certainly chest should be imaged thoroughly. But my go-to now for, for advanced kidney cancer is uh, certainly CT of the chest, CT or, or MRI of the abdomen and other testing directed based on, you know, concern for other metastatic sites. Um, I have shifted gears in recent years and and, and generally uh, when I deal with uh, tumors that invade into 
At the Venus system, I now routinely obtain a brain MRI uh, because there's high prevalence of metastatic disease to the brain, even, even if it's uh, asymptomatic. Certainly, if there are symptoms, CNS sy symptoms that are present and there's bone concerns, then direct radiographic imaging is probably warranted in addition to what we've just mentioned. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that I certainly learned from Vitaly uh, in training is particularly in patients with higher level thrombi that may undergo cardiopulmonary bypass with uh, anticoagulation. You really want to have a lay of the land with respect to brain imaging. You don't want them to be anticoagulated and then have a catastrophic CNS bleeding event. Fantastic. And what about bone scans? Routinely ordered uh, reflex for ab abnormal laboratory values? Yeah. So, you know, unexplained uh, uh, markers of bone turnover. Um, certainly symptoms, bone-related symptoms, I think these will be triggers, but that's not something that I routinely uh, would get because uh, outside of those findings, the yield on that on something like this would be pretty low. Okay. PET scans, any role? Very limited, uh, specifically in RCC. Um, I would say for, for you know all intents and purposes, minimal role right now. Got it. So you'd, you'd mentioned a little bit leg swelling and so forth, and sometimes with uh, tumor thrombus, cases, we see um, two clinical scenarios. One is bland thrombus, and one can be pulmonary emboli. Can you talk about how that uh, impacts your, your perioperative management and approach to those patients? Yeah, so these are these are now we started getting into you know, some of the more challenging scenarios, and, and uh, what you're alluding to are, are, are patients with uh, cable tumor thrombus and sequelae of which can be blend obstruction or blend thrombus that forms below the thrombus, uh, the tumor thrombus resulting in, in lower extremity swelling and also obviously pulmonary emboli. Um, and these are tricky situations and, and what you, one has to balance anticoagulation, um, but, but also you have to carefully balance that with the risk of pretty massive bleeding from the primary. Uh, generally, uh, patients with evidence of bland thrombus and, and or pulmonary emboli, I would um, probably anticoagulate going into surgery um, and resume that anticoagulation shortly after uh, once the patient is deemed, uh, deemed safe after, after the operation. Okay. And this is a clinical scenario that we encounter not frequently, but not infrequently. Can you talk a little bit about your patient with a bleeding mask, transfusion-dependent hematuria? that um, either due to patient or tumor factors wouldn't be an ideal candidate for upfront nephrectomy. Do you have kind of an algorithm that you could share with us? Well, I mean, yes, the first thing you would do, I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, bleeds are self-limited and, and uh, just simple supportive measures, uh, they may resolve. Obviously, in some cases, if patient is on anticoagulation, we may have to hold the anticoagulation, maybe resume at, at the lower dose. But if that doesn't work and there's really truly uh, a um, transfusion requiring requiring bleed, you might have to one have might have to reevaluate your strategy of not operating. Sometimes you just have to pull the trigger and operate. But in situations where that is not possible, then I think there's a couple of um, uh, tricks up up our sleeve that we have. One of these would be uh, obviously angioembolization, and the second, which works well, uh, but it obviously has you know, subsequent sequelae that, that, that one has, has to deal with. Another option is actually delivery of um, uh, radiation to the primary. And that's something I think we have pioneered, pion well, not pioneered, but have quite a bit of experience here at UT Southwestern. We're very fortunate to have a very robust radiation outfit here, radiation oncology outfit. And, at, you know, in several cases that I've been involved with, uh, delivery of um, SBRT to the primary has been very effective in, in palliating the bleeding. Yeah, I think that's a very uh, rational approach and um, wholeheartedly agree that I would say that the paradigm in Dallas has largely shifted to in these relatively rare tumors, unresectable for whatever reason, start out with uh, radiotherapy. If that doesn't work, reserve embolization. Okay, so I think these are some, you know, some really nice uh, pearls for management of these sometimes difficult features. And um you know, I know that we're primarily focusing our efforts on locally advanced, but in the cases where you have metastases, and let's just say these are not extensive metastases, maybe a, you know, a pulmonary nodule um, that's a centimeter or so, um, maybe a, a pancreatic met or a liver met, um, can you talk a little bit about the role of biopsy and what to biopsy? That's a good question. Um... You know, I wanted to add something to a pre previous discussion. Is something that that I routinely see in the community is is this uh, going back to the thrombus. And I'll answer your subsequent question. I didn't mean to to to, to skip, but 
just for the audience, you know, it's not uncommon for me to see a patient that that with a thrombus and, for example, maybe a pulmonary embolus who's completely stable but um, uh, comes comes in with the filter. And so there's this knee jerk reaction to to place a vena cava filter to um, uh, suppress further or prevent further tumor thrombus uh, emboliza, emboli from the you know from tumor thrombus in a patient. And that's actually exactly the wrong thing to do. Not only complicates uh, further surgical intervention. I think it makes it a lot more dangerous and um, really has not been really shown to prevent additional uh, pulmonary um, emboli. So I think um, we just have to temper our, our immediate <laughs> need to to put a vena cable, or cable tumor thrombus. It's just one of those things that pet peeve of mine, but I see that happen very frequently in the community. So back, back to your question of what to biopsy, I think, um, this this has to be a discussion with um, with your uh, interventional radiologist. I think that the, the first thing is safety to the patient, um, if they and, and the comfort level of the your interventional radiologist. I mean, if your if your only goal is to get tissue diagnosis to start treatment, I think probably you know not super important where you biopsy. I would probably go for the easiest um, site to get tissue. Um, there are nuances. Some of these uh, renal tumors are excessively vascular, and actually a biopsy can trigger a significant hemorrhage of the primary. Maybe sometimes it's best to go for the for the metastatic side. But there are other situations where you want to make sure, you know, in your scenario that you gave with a, you know, with a, for example, solitary pulmonary nodule, it's not unheard of for a patient to have a second primary. So in that case, perhaps to, to further plan treatment, maybe more prudent to biopsy the, the lung nodule. There are other nuances. Uh, something recently that has uh, uh, that I've dealt with was was a you know relatively indolent looking primary but massive retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy. And so one has to think about you know again secondary malignancies, lymphomas, and maybe it's more prudent to biopsy um, your your lymph nodes in, in that setting. There's no one answer to fit all scenarios. I think several things are at play here, um, and but these are the conversations that should be should happen in a multidisciplinary setting. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more that um, multidisciplinary collaborative management is absolutely key. And that would actually dovetail in quite nicely to the next thing, which I think is rapidly expanding in this area, which is consideration of neoadjuvant or induction therapy for locally advanced kidney cancer. Could you comment a little bit about that, Vitaly? Yeah, you know, so if we think about management of locally advanced kidney cancer over the last you know, how many years, um, there's not been much of a change. This to this date, if you know, if you look at um, sort of gold standard of care, this remains a surgical disease, and we unfortunately have not embraced. Although this this is this is about to change, but we really not embraced uh, multimodal management as a routine for advanced kidney cancer, unlike some of the other urologic malignancies, you know, bladder, testicular cancer, penile cancer, et cetera, where multimodal management is probably the standard of care, not so much in advanced um, kidney cancer. So uh, this is a rapidly changing field, I think, with, with, with newer therapies um, that we have access to. So I think this is an exciting field. Uh, to your question about uh, neoadjuvant uh, therapies, again, uh, this is something that I would say that has to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Certainly, I would say not the standard of care. And, and again, your locally advanced disease mainly is surgical disease at this point. Uh, some of the things that where I utilize neoadjuvant uh, paradigms would be uh, in unique situations where we need to cite to reduce the primary to to be able to um, uh, deliver, for example, nephron sparing in a situation where a complete nephrectomy would result in an anephric state. Typical example, a patient with solitary kidney, large tumor, where a partial nephrectomy may not be feasible, delivering uh, a systemic therapy in a neoadjuvant fashion to uh, to shrink the tumor and allow, me, and allow me to perform a partial nephrectomy would be a very common example. Other uses, I would say, they're, again, pretty rare situations where the primary may not be resectable safely. Again, that's that's a rare, rare bird, and we need to shrink the tumor to be able to uh, to be able to do the surgery uh, safely. Uh, that would be a second indication, probably less common in my practice. Okay, okay. And um, can you just give us a little bit, um, you know, without getting into the details, a uh, general systemic therapy that you use, the general duration of use, the general period of washout prior to surgery? 
and when you re-image to assess response? So the, the two broad categories of systemic therapies that there are, we know are effective for kidney cancer are your targeted therapies that target the VEGF pathway hmm. and our checkpoint inhibitors that, that modulate the immune response. And um, you have to sort of think what what are you trying to achieve uh, with, with your systemic therapy. If it's purely for site reduction, then um, your later generation targeted therapies, such as, for example, like Sitnib, uh, uh, that we know have been shown to be effective in sight to reducing or shrinking the tumor um, is something that, that that should be considered. The, again, we don't have much data uh, in this, and so a lot of what I will say is anecdotal. I have recently, again, shifted sort of my approach to this and I actually use a combination of uh, third generation or later generation targeted agent with the checkpoint inhibitor. So something along uh, the lines of Axitin and Pembro, prior to surgery and just anecdotally have, have had very good success with this. And the nice thing about this combination is we know that with purely, again, not getting too much into the weeds, but purely with targeted therapies, there's almost zero chance of a complete response. But when you add pembrolizumab or some sort of a checkpoint inhibitor, we now have, uh, and I've personally had uh, several cases where there has been a complete response uh, in a primary. So. So I've shifted gears recently, and now basically my go-to combination would be a, uh, my go-to therapy would be a combination type therapy. How long? Um, so again, uh, you know, uh, something that I use in my clinical practice, I, I, I go until maximal response. And so uh, patients get the therapy, we get essentially almost monthly imaging. Um, and once I see maximal response, this is probably the time to intervene. And uh, what we know with, uh, when, when you start utilizing, and this is an important caveat, when you start uh, using some of these checkpoint inhibitors, uh, you actually uh, can get an initial almost pseudoprogression where the tumor seems to swell, uh, but then will eventually start shrinking. So it's important not to, not to pull the trigger. Um, it's very uncommon for patients actually to have a disease progression and a dual therapy like this. And usually during the first round of imaging, if one sees some swelling, uh, it's usually this element of pseudo progression and usually continue the therapy again until maximal progression if the che if the um VEGF targeted agent is used it might usually give it about a couple of weeks to wash out and uh, patients should be ready to go for surgery perfect perfect and so you mentioned solitary kidneys um kind of almost absolute indications to avoid an adenephric state just a comment bilateral masses one more oncologically threatening than the other um you know of course you're going to have that patient see medical genetics but um, general strategy in terms of, you know, this is something that's been historically debated. Do you go for the partial nephrectomy potentially first and you have some nephronic reserve from the other side? Or do you typically go for the more oncologically threatening tumor? Yeah, but my, my thought has been to, to remove the most biologically threatening uh, entity uh, from the equation. So I usually tend to go for the, you know, for your, for your bulky, you know, non partial uh, side first and then deal with with the other side. But again, with you know, when you start considering systemic therapies, if for example, one side is clearly partiable, the other side may be, one may consider doing a lead in with systemic therapy and see if we can deliver uh, nephron sparing in both sides. And so it's a little bit nuanced, but but generally to answer your question, I would go for the biologically aggressive entity first and and uh, deal with a, with a um, nephron sparing on the other side later. Fantastic. And I think it really highlights, you know, the coordinated care between medical oncologists, um, even radiation oncologists, radiologists that are familiar with um, progression, pseudoprogression, careful administration of these systemic therapies to um, really have a smooth, uh, smooth course. Really nice. And who all are you sending for uh, medical genetics referral? So certainly, obviously, these are young patients. These are the patients with family histories. Um, so certainly anybody under 50 with, with a, a kidney tumor now in my practice gets essentially automatic genetic testing, certainly if there's family history, um, certainly if there are syndromic features, and these are the patients with, you know, a, you know adrenal tumors, pancreatic tumors, and any, any concern for BHL, any concern for other, you know, RCC type syndromes, young women, for example, pretty, pretty classically ignored scenarios, small, small renal mass, but history of uterine malignancy of some sort, uh, you should, you know, scream HLRCC. These, these are more biologically aggressive tumors that you may, you may decide to manage uh, in a nuanced fashion. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, just little things like carefully reviewing your imaging to make sure there's not any uh, suggestion of any type of uterine pathology, little things like this can be um, 
massive in terms of tipping you off for focused questions. All right, very good. So we've talked a little bit about staging. We've talked a little bit about um, biopsy, the role. I, uh, I think we could have a whole nother conversation on cytoreductive nephrectomy, risk stratification, you know, who may benefit and not, and perhaps that'd be a good topic for a future episode. But maybe now let's just jump into it. And, um, you know, way I kind of think about these is, you know, for locally advanced, as you described earlier, is you have your, your kind of perinephric fat invasion family, then you have your sinus fat and, um, and hyalur structures kind of close to the kidney, then you have your regional lymph node patients, and then finally, of course, your thrombus patients. I would just request that you comment on that and also just talk about aspects of uh, imaging that you're really dialed in on as you're, as you're planning surgery. Um, let's just say that you've, you've kind of discussed with them some clinical trials. I know Vitaly has been a leading accruer for the PROSPER trial, which is uh, very, very exciting. But uh, when, you're, when you're looking at the imaging, what are the things that you're dialed in on? Yeah, so again, you know, how, how big is the primary? Um, you know, so, so I started thinking, okay, obviously if we start, start talking about tumor thrombus that patient, obviously the level of the thrombus, degree of obstruction, degree of colorization. You know, I almost think about my thrombus patients completely differently when I plan my, my surgical approach. I, almost every single one of these cases will be done in an open uh, fashion. Uh, some of the things to uh, to understand is, as we said, what what team do I need with me? And so when you when you do these uh, thrombus cases, I think you need to have a well oiled team. This has to be, uh, you know, you want to experiment. You want to have a well assembled partner in crime, whether it be a cardiovascular thoracic surgeon, vascular surgeon, liver transplant surgeon. I actually utilize probably all of them, depending on where the thrombus is. You know, for your retrohepatic thrombi, the thrombi, thrombi they don't extend above the diaphragm. I've recently shifted to partnering with a um, uh, liver transplant colleague. Uh, and, and these surgeons are very useful to help you mobilize the liver, get all the hepatic branches controlled, get the liver out of the way, control the cava just below the diaphragm. And so the tumor thrombi that on radiographically are above the diaphragm, obviously this is where you have to have a good partnership with the cardiovascular or thoracic team, uh, which we do here. Um, and those those cases probably are best done uh, in collaboration with them in case of bypass or, or circ arrest will be needed. So again, the level of thrombus is critical. Uh, is, the, is there a blend thrombus? Um, do we need to resect the cava? Uh, is there enough colorization to uh, allow for safe resection of the cave up without reconstruction? So, so those are all the technical things that go through my mind. Uh, but these are these are specific to the thrombus cases. Now, when you start looking at other cases, maybe Vitaly, since we since you've kind of jumped into thrombi, which is yeah. always a challenging multidisciplinary case, I'm going to ask you a a few questions before we move on to some of the other ones. Um, Bud Chiari syndrome. If you you know get in, you've got evidence of liver chemistry elevation or you encounter ascites, any unique considerations in that patient population? Well, I mean, ideally, yes, of course, but ideally this is something that you, if true, true Bud Chiari syndrome should be identifiable prior to surgery. And, and, and these are not the patients that should be managed with upfront surgery. So this is one rare indication where I would consider leading in with multimodality therapies first to allow for recanalization and proper drainage of the liver because these, these are not generally survivable surgeries. So if you have a full-blown Bacchiari syndrome, I think rushing into the surgery is, is not the best uh, thing for the patient. His mortality rates are nearly 100% in that case. If you have, uh, for whatever reason, encountered some maybe early manifestations of a Bacchiari syndrome as maybe some degree of hepatic dysfunction without, without full-blown hepatotoxicity, then it's a clinical decision, I think, whether one should proceed. And I mean, it's, a, it's in some cases very hard to make that decision. Just presence of ascites uh, alone during surgery probably is not contraindication. Um, there have been cases where we get in, but there are other signs of liver dysfunction, such as, you know, terrible appearing, con completely congested liver that's friable with, with immediate bleeding upon everything that you touch with, with ascites. And this may be the case where I would say, you know what, maybe, maybe we'll close and, and manage uh, with systemic and or radiation therapy first and then come back to fight another day. Uh, but ascites alone probably wouldn't be the reason to, to stop. And again, I mean, I just want to stress that, that, that this is one condition where, where we really need to diagnose before taking a patient to surgery. Okay, good point. So you'd mentioned bland thrombus cable resection. 
broad strokes when you start these operations? Do you typically work on the um, vascular structures first? Um, you know, if it's a right-sided tumor, early control of the artery, for instance, um, in the intra cable space, gaining access to your contralateral renal vein, your infrahepatic IVC, um, superthrombus IVC. Can you just talk a little bit about you know how you think about that and approach that? There be some differences uh, in technique among different institutions. So what what I've done over the years is have good control of the primary uh, without unnecessarily disturbing the thrombus. And the idea here is we don't want to the thrombus to embolize. So so if the primary is controlled, the arterial flow to the primary is controlled. In some cases, this results in shrinking of the thrombus, perhaps making the, the thrombectomy portion easier. Once the primary and the arterial inflow is controlled, then you know we go through our routine steps to isolate the tumor thrombus within the venous system. So it's generally, you know, isolating the suprathrombus cava, isolating the portal system if necessary, it's certainly infra uh, thrombus cava. Uh, so once you have the cava isolated, then then the thrombectomy ensues, and the rest of the primary is removed once the the cava is closed. Uh, some of the nuances you mentioned, um, in some cases, the cava has been obstructed for a long time, and it's probably even safer to resect uh, the, the thrombus with the cava. Um, and if that if that is your clinical judgment, then it's very important to preserve that colors, uh, collaterals that have formed over the years the patient has proper venous return. Excellent, excellent points. And, um, you know, I think uh, it's very obvious to me that each one of these cases is unique. Um, you've really got to study the imaging. You've got to have a plan going into it. And I think you've also got to be ready for, you know, some various things that can happen intraoperatively. I recall as a resident doing a case with Vitaly, it was a relatively low level two thrombus uh, for no reason with no manipulation of the cava. There was an embolization event, rapidly mo mobilized, performed thoracotomy, um, embolectomy, and the patient had a wonderful postoperative course. But you can imagine that uh, if you don't take these cases seriously, you could have a very different outcome. You know, I think, again, Vitaly's really stressed the need to prepare, to plan, to uh, be ready intraoperatively. I think you routinely use intraoperative uh, echo in close collaboration with the, with the uh, cardiovascular anesthesiologist. But any other things that you'd like to mention specifically about um, IVC thrombus cases? Um, again, if, if I have to mention one thing, is to have a well-oiled team put together. And, and it can be your choice, but you want to work with people that you're comfortable working. You want to have a good anesthesia, anesthesiologist that generally understands, you know, all of the nuances or that are uh, applicable to, to cases where it could be high volume blood loss. You want to have an anesthesiology team with echo, cardiac echo capabilities. And um, as you know, I do essentially every one of these cases in a situation where access to a quick pump if we need to crash on pump during some of the situations you've just described is available. That that would be the most uh, critical um, aspect. You have to have, then you have to think about how am I going to reconstruct my cava? So you have to be, you know, have access to things like, uh, you know, Fogarty catheters to embolize blend thrombus or, or de-embolize blend, blend thrombus if necessary. You have to have access to your Dacron grafts. You have to have access to your patches if the cava needs to be patched. It's a, it's a it's a highly nuanced surgery, but but the key here is I cannot overstress this enough is to have a team in place that are familiar with those cases. Perfect. So maybe now we uh, shift a little bit to node clinically node positive, radiographically node positive patients, and maybe I'll ask you to just talk a little bit about the um, role of lymph node dissection in in those patients, as well as the performance of routine lymph node dissection in other high risk patients without radiographic evidence of uh, nodal's involvement? So certainly, you know, your, your first case scenario where we have gross radiographic evidence of nodal disease, with, with modern imaging, most uh, those most certainly will have uh, metastases. That seems pretty, pretty rare to have a false positive. Um, and if this is the only side of their disease, then I think, you know, uh, resection of the primary and a thorough lymph node dissection, not just node plucking, probably template, template disse dissection is, is something that should be performed. It gets a little bit more murky, I would say, with uh, lymph node dissection in the setting of clinically node negative disease. The data has gone back and forth over the years. Uh, I certainly can make a reasonable case to to perform this in high risk populations. So you're, these are your thrombus cases. These are the cases, perhaps where where there is 
super bulky tumor with ipsilateral adrenal involvement, for example, I can make an argument to, to perform lymph node dissection, even in a, if, there's, if those nodes are radiographically or clinically negative because there's higher risk for regional nodal involvement. Uh, the implication of that is, is a little bit less clear, but we certainly all had cases over the years where lymph node dissection was not performed and we had to go back in to remove that lymph node. So it's a lot easier to get it at the time of surgery. I would say the uh, added morbidity to performing um, uh, a regional lymph node dissection at the time of a nephrectomy is, I would say, limited. This can be done quickly without significant morbidity to the patient. So I, I do this. Can I show you the data that it changes patient outcome routinely? I probably can't. But, I, I, you know, uh, if, you, if you look at the description of a classic nephrectomy, uh, still, it's, it's removal of the regional lymph nodes with the bulky primary. Okay. And, uh, and again, I recall from, you know, training and my understanding of the literature that certain high-risk populations where you're suspecting, say, HLRCC or any of the more aggressive uh, hereditary cancer syndromes, you'll oftentimes do a lymph node dissection even if a partial nephrectomy is planned. Is that right? Yeah, so that's a good point, and that, that's that's uh, um, these are again nuanced situations. So things like uh, certainly HLRCC are more um, probably even more common in my practice would be your translocation carcinomas. So these are young folks with translocation tumors, they that have a, a higher propensity uh, for nodal disease, and so those are the patients I would offer a routine um, lymph node dissection in a setting of uh, clinically negative nodes. But these, right. these are minority, these are very few of the, the, the real question is whether we should be doing lymph node dissections or just in your regular average bulky tumor. And, you know, here's, here's the data is a little bit murky. Yeah. And, and I think uh, those patients that you mentioned oftentimes have a prolonged local regional phase where you can really um, help them and potentially get to a curative state. So fantastic point. Uh, you mentioned adrenalectomy. When are you performing adrenalectomy, tumor location, tumor features? What are the, some of the things that are driving that discussion? Yeah, certainly, you know, with modern radiographic imaging leading into the surgery, and again, the data supports this. If the tumor is away from the adrenal, adrenal is not involved and looks looks uh, normal radiographically, probably can be left alone. There are certain uh, situations if there's concern for, again, direct extension into the adrenal. Uh, and certainly, it's situations where there is a tumor thrombus, especially on the left side where, the, as you know, drainage of the adrenal and drainage of the kidney uh, are intertwined. At least I perform the adrenalectomy. Again, there's higher propensity for uh, adrenal involvement in those situations. Uh, so again, it's a concern for, for direct in involvement, uh, concern for ipsilateral adrenal metastasis, and uh, your bulky tumor thrombus cases, uh, adrenal comes out. Makes sense. Makes sense. And I think it's supported by data as well. Okay. So um, a lot, you mentioned template dissections. Are these going to be you know, kind of commensurate with testis cancer dissections, or are there any uh, considerations you'd like to share? Yeah, so this is basically, uh, for template dissection, what I mean by this is is your um, uh, ipsilateral lymph nodes plus one area next to. So so if on the right side, this will be paracable, intraarachable. I don't think one needs to take this to the same degree as what we do for, you know, teratoma debulkings in testicular cancer. But I think a thorough, especially in a setting of where we're doing purely staging lymph node dissection, I think it's one area removed from, from where you are is probably sufficient. Okay. Okay. And, and this isn't the primary driver consideration here, obviously, but um, when you bill for these cases, any uh, tips and tricks? Yeah. And so <laughs> it just... It can be challenging. I mean, I think you really have to work with your coders and billers because these are pretty nuanced cases. And I think, again, you want to have ongoing discussions with the billing team because there's quite variability of how things could be billed. So so to your point, if you bill for a radical nephrectomy, but you also do a template limb node dissection, there's a separate code that should be utilized uh, because uh, what's rolled into your into your uh, lymph node dissection with the primary is just regional hyalur lymph nodes. So if you go uh, outside of that, this could be billed and there's quite, quite a few RBUs that uh, could be left on the table if you don't. Okay. Perinephric sinus involvement, is that a, is that a reflex? Uh, and I'm talking about, um, you know, extending towards gerotas. Is that a reflex radical nephrectomy in your hands? I mean, nothing should be reflex, but generally, yes. I mean, if we have clear-cut evidence that the tumor is central, uh, if it extends into the sinus, certainly, some of the tumors extend outside, um, outside sort of outward of the kidney. Again, you have to, it's a multifactorial decision. You have to, you have to think, okay, is this obviously in an elective setting? Is it an imperative setting, borderline? Um, how technically is partial feasible? Um, and it's also another discussion that has to be 
uh, help with the patient. Obviously, the last thing you want to do is do something like this in an elective setting, get into the tumor, have local tumor recurrence. Uh, and we've, we've all had these disaster cases where patients came in with peritoneal carcinomatosis from an attempt for nephron sparing that shouldn't have been performed. So I think it's nuanced decision. Does it automatically mean a radical nephrectomy? No. But I mean, I think one has to evaluate this from the multifactorial perspective. And what about sinus fat? Um, you know, one thing I recall is oftentimes for very central tumors, you will obtain a biopsy just to make sure that you're, you know, in a patient that's a high risk of receiving a radical nephrectomy potentially, that um, you want to make sure that this isn't something that's uh, benign or, or likely to be a very little oncologic threat. Are you still doing that? I'm doing this. Uh, so if you have, you know, there's a smaller tumor that doesn't look biologically aggressive, but located in a such location that perhaps you may have a hard time finding it. Or we are, you know, that if you start opening the kidney up and getting to the sinus, there's pretty good chance for a radical nephrectomy. And so I, I would period, I would probably obtain a biopsy of this to confirm that this is in fact a cancerous lesion before performing a surgery that could potentially result in a kidney loss. I mean, it would be a shame to do something like this for, for a, you know, an oncocytoma and something that could be safely monitored and, and have a patient lose, lose the kidney. And, and of course, there's patient spec factors, there's renal function reserve and so forth. But if you have central tumors that are relatively smaller, concern for segmental, subsegmental venous branch invasion or sinus fat invasion, do you still keep partial nephrectomy as a part of your armamentarium? You know, it's really hard to, to definitively show a segmental, radiographically segmental moment of the venous system by a tumor and a lot of a lot of the stuff this stuff a lot of the times this is artifactual so you have to make a decision whether whether you could again in your hands and, and again it's different from surgeon to surgeon you have to factor in your experience at your comfort level into the equation but for an elective setting i would i would have a pretty good reason not to offer radical nephrectomy honestly if i if i highly suspect that there is venous involvement in an elective setting and what about if you encounter a tumor thrombus intraoperatively well, uh, again, I mean, if if the, the the partial goes well and there's a nodule of the tumor that goes to the vein that you that I'm confident that I've removed appropriately and all the tumor is out, um, then I would probably complete a partial nephrectomy, uh, reconstruct the venous system, um, and uh, move on. Certainly, at that point, you're already committed. You know, all the all the most of the tumor has been dissected properly, and you're getting a negative margin. There's pretty good data to suggest that partial nephrectomy provides equivalent oncologic outcome compared to radical nephrectomy in that setting. So if you get all the tumor out, the margins are good, and the outcomes long-term are the same whether you performed a partial or radical. Do you have any strong opinions on enucleation versus formal partial nephrectomy in these types of cases? Again, so this is something that you look at uh, radiographically. If it's an infiltrative tumor or there's concern for tumor infiltration, not a well-defined capsule, this may be a tumor that I would probably not attempt a nucleation on and would probably lean towards a more, you know, standard uh, resection. Uh, but this is actually a minority. And I think uh, I, I've switched over the years to to doing more of what something called a nuclear resection, probably where where you stay very close to the tumor capsule. And it's it's been very beneficial uh, from several perspectives. Number one perspective is that you know, when, the, when there are contour irregularities, if you stay close to the tumor capsule, it can actually recognize a nodule of the tumor extending somewhere uh, and get around it. Uh, I've, I've seen that happen in multiple cases. It actually has helped me to get a negative margin when you stay close to the capsule because you follow the contour of the tumor. Not all the tumors are exactly spherical, so you can avoid getting into a nodular extension. Uh, the second thing is I think, you know, you, you end up cutting across fewer vessels this way. And so if you do a true sort of partial nephrectomy, you probably do a lot more damage that way, end up sewing a lot more and probably with longer ischemia times, et cetera, et cetera. Certainly, multiple, certainly there's plenty of data to suggest that oncologically, whether you do a nucleation or, or a radical nephrectomy, as long as you're good at what you're doing, I think the oncologic outcomes are similar. Yeah, and I think that leads me into one of the other things that I just wanted to quickly touch on, which um, globally, I'm going to guess that we agree that really use the tools that you're comfortable with and um, most adept with, but robotic versus open. You'd mentioned thrombus cases. Those are pretty much going to be open. I think that's the case um, at most centers other than a few era select centers. Tumor size, lymph nodes, what are some of the factors that are going into, uh, you know, whether this might be a reasonable patient for a robotic or minimally invasive approach? 
Again, I mean, as, as as we have all gotten more and more comfortable with you know with robotic slash laparoscopic approach, I think more and more cases now I I do robotic um, that that I was doing open in the past. Main, the main factor here is the size of the tumor. Will I be able to get good retraction on the tumor on the kidney and still be able to see the structures that I need to see? And if that's the case, and that's my judgment, then I usually do those, those cases robotically. I think robotic platform allows you to do an addition of lymph node dissections, even venous reconstructions, and it's something that I think most of us were not comfortable doing that with pure laparoscopic approach. So the bottom line is that tumor tumor is small, uh, and uh, in, in even presence of lymph node disease, as long as it's not super bulky and encasing the vessels, a lot of these tumors I would do I would do with a robotic approach. Good. Yeah, I would wholeheartedly agree. And you talked about, you know, uh, encasement of the vessels. I think even over the course of my five years as an attending, that has kind of shifted, you know, outside of massive hemat- transfusion-dependent hematuria, significant symptoms, et cetera, to a case where I'd really potentially like to get um, some systemic therapy on board before jumping in. I think those can be dangerous cases and the chance of actually getting a R0 resection are, uh, you know, very, very small. Any comment on that? I would say that yeah, it's a it's a double edged sword. Um, a lot of these cases with this bulky lymph nodes encasing the the great vessels, th- these are generally systemically metastatic cases that probably should be treated with systemic therapy. But you have to realize that uh, if if there's any chance of resection, when you come back post systemic therapies, the, the the tissue planes now have have changed tremendously. And the desmoplastic reaction that that you that you will have to deal with. Whatever it may may negate the, the the little shrinkage that you have achieved. Okay, so you have to really think about this. And if you have, if you plan to come back, and and the patient does have some bulky disease that perhaps is resectable, you really have to make that decision. I think I think for me, using systemic therapy in, in those settings is is driven by the fact that these are generally sy- patients with systemic disease. Good point. And um, Vitaly was a senior author in one of the first papers looking at cytoreductive nephrectomy after induction checkpoint inhibitors. And uh, I think it's safe to summarize that, um, you know, a carefully selected patient, um, there's a lot of nuances, you know, single agent, double agent, timing from initiation to surgery, but um, in experienced hands that patients can do quite well. How about adjuvant therapy? What what are your thoughts on um, adjuvant therapy once you've got your pathology back, patients have uh, recovered from surgery? Well, again, as, as, as we sit here today and talk, you know, the, the, there's no... No adjuvant therapy that I use in my clinical practice. As you know, there have been multiple trials of, uh, you know, of every agent in the history of of of, of, uh, of systemic therapy that have been tried in kidney cancer. If you go back, you know, years, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, inter- interferons, targeted therapies have been tried. We you know that Sutent has actually been approved by the FDA for as an adjuvant treatment for locally post surgery post surgery for locally advanced kidney cases. Uh, but uh, not while Sutent in this setting has afforded delay in tumor recurrence, it really has not changed survival. Uh, so the OS endpoint was not met. And so basically you're giving a patient a tox- pretty toxic therapy, I would say, for, for a year or so. Um, uh, and, and all you're doing is really just delaying their recurrence, but not making them live longer. So that, that's not an acceptable strategy in my hands. And I think, I think most people don't use uh, these therapies uh, at this point. Now, there have been a recent uh, a new development, uh, as you may know, and Keytruda has shown significant met the, the, the trial of adjuvant Keytruda has met this primary endpoint of recurrence-free survival uh, in an adjuvant setting. I think um, we will see approval of checkpoint inhibitors in an adjuvant setting. The difference here is that the, the we know the mechanism of action of checkpoint inhibitors actually allow for uh, sterilization of metastatic disease, which which we ne- almost never see with TKIs, and so I think that the game this is a game changer. I think the that targeted therapy, sorry, the immune, checkpoint inhibitors, immunotherapy will be um, a, a major paradigm shift in an adjuvant setting. Perfect, and I think there's you know there's so much that's exciting and coming through the pipeline: novel agents, theranostics, improved imaging, selection of patients that may or may not have had a complete response to checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, local therapy of metastases, the role of cytoreductive nephrectomy. You know, I think we're really on the cusp of a of a very, very exciting time in the management of kidney cancer. You know, as we conclude, Vitaly, I would maybe just ask you to, uh, you know, kind of share some 
some of your perspective, you've been doing this for some time now, over a decade on, you know, what's kind of coming through the pipelines, what's on the horizon to really help these patients out. Yeah, I mean, I think so kidney cancer is finally entering the era of really truly personalized medicine. And I think with some of the diagnostic and therapeutic technologies that you've mentioned, you know, things like circulating tumor DNA, tumor profiling to understand, you know, which patients are at, at high degree probability of relapse, and if they do relapse, how to treat them. And I think we finally have the tools that may allow us to deliver therapies that would likely impact the biology that the patient possesses. As of now, you know, we treat we, we treat this sort of by oncologist preference, you know. Somebody, somebody gives TKI, somebody gives this, somebody gives that. We don't have a rational strategy of how to address this disease. But I think I think that the tools are there. I think the data is exciting. Some of the newer uh, PET imaging that, that actually can help us understand whether, whether, for example, a metastatic site is immunoprivileged or not. And then we have actually some data to suggest that, you know, Using radiation, for example, can can convert somebody who's who has an immune immune privileged metastasis to somebody who will respond to immune therapy, and so this is you know again a truly truly an exciting era where we're now combining multiple specialist specialties. You know, we, we're utilizing predictors of response in the form of circulating tumor cells or circulating tumor DNA. We're finally entering the per personalized era in, in management of kidney cancer. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. And I think we both would agree that we're extremely lucky to be at UT Southwestern that has such a robust kidney cancer program, including a SPORE, where you know all complex case cases are discussed in a multidisciplinary format. And the nuanced care that Vitaly's alluded to mul multiple times is extremely uh, obvious. And the... Um, you know, thoughtful discussion of these patients from A to Z, I, I think really has a, a massive impact, uh, which we've shown here, you know, kind of across um, stages is the output. And, you know, I think something that uh, I would encourage all urologists to spearhead at their own institutions. Well, Vitaly, a, a true wealth of information, um, you know, really appreciate your time. If there's uh Anything you'd like to add, by all means. Otherwise, I, I thank you for sh sharing your knowledge and your wisdom. I've certainly learned a lot, and uh, hopefully our audience and, and listenership would as well. Thank you, Aditya. Not much to add, but thank you for the expert moderation, and it's always, always uh, good to hang out with you.